Okay, welcome everybody to the Vocational Science of Freedom Civics and Sovereignty class. And this will be a continuation of going over the Grand Jury Manual from California. And we spent the last several Saturdays going over this Grand Jury Manual. And I've been reading from it and then talking about how the difference between a de jure Grand Jury made up of 25 members of the peerage would operate compared to how this civil grand jury manual is laid out for basically 14th Amendment citizens of the United States and the difference in their powers. And now we're getting to, I believe it's page 62, but in the grand jury manual, it's page 41. So just be aware of that. So to join in these discussions on the vocational science of freedom, you can join the Gilded server and up in the banner here, when you join the Gilded server, make sure that you hit apply and not just follow. And the link to the Vocational Science of Freedom Gilded server can be found in the show notes slash description links on either YouTube or Odyssey or BitChute, whichever platform you might be listening to. So to get started here, we have gone, as you can see, about one third of the way through this grand jury manual. And we're now on powers and duties of the grand jury regarding governmental affairs. So each grand jury as required by law receives detailed and extensive instructions regarding its powers and duties from the presiding judge of the superior court. Okay, a superior court. In California, in the California Constitution, the superior courts are courts of record because it says that in the California Constitution, all courts are courts of record. And that's also an aspect of being a superior court. And in the understanding of that the judge, the presiding judge of the superior court, that the grand jury receives extensive instructions regarding its powers and duties from the presiding judge. Okay. That, whoops, sorry. That they receive extensive instructions regarding their powers from the presiding judge is not the totality of what their powers are. I can guarantee you that for two reasons. One, this is a civil grand jury manual. So what is civil law? Civil law is Roman civil law. You can always couple those two things together. So whenever you see the term civil law, it always means Roman civil law. So meaning the law that deals with the running of a municipality. And sometimes they even call civil law or Roman civil law municipal law, right? So this is where you have the understanding of the difference between corporate governance and governance of the people in a common law jurisdiction being constitutionally created. And, and that's the difference between us running everything in the way we should be running everything in the Republic compared to how they're running everything in a democracy, which is run by a corporate governance. So just to clarify that in the first sentence. All right, second sentence. The present document is designed to inform the grand jury of available assistance and general guidelines applicable to the duties of the jury, which pertain to civil, again, Roman civil law, and governmental affairs. When a juror takes an oath of office, he or she becomes not only a responsible officer of the court, but a student of local government operations. I would pretty much agree with that. Uh, but you're not bound by any rules of the court, because as we've gone over multiple times in this grand jury manual, everything that they're saying here is simply a suggestion. It's not an absolute controlling factor as to what you can or can't do in a grand jury when you have formed a 25-member grand jury of the peerage. Not anything less than 25 or consisting of citizens of the United States, right, under the 14th Amendment, who are subject to the jurisdiction of Congress. So, to continue, due to the increasingly complicated nature of local governmental operations, grand jurors sometimes expend substantial efforts in a frustrating attempt to secure information or data which is actually readily available upon appropriate inquiry. And that's true. The grand jury has the capacity to access pretty much anything they want to, but they don't have to go through the rigmarole of creating subpoenas and whatnot to get it. They don't have to use their power to get it. They can simply get it by simply asking for it. So um, the, the point here being that 
you have access to the information anytime you want to. And so there are certain ways to just simply get it without having to subpoena it from your local various different agencies or governmental offices. So to continue, likewise, extensive investigation may sometimes be undertaken by the jury on mistaken assumption of illegality or impropriety, which is true. So just know what the rules are and simply be able to get it without having to worry about uh, going through all of the extensive powers that you could bring up or flex, I guess, as a 25-member grand jury of the peerage. Most of these documents will simply be available to you, and all you have to do is ask for them. So, to continue, much of the grand jury's effectiveness is derived from the fact that the viewpoint of its members is fresh and unencumbered by prior conceptions about government. Well, that's pretty much the, the case. But again, the reason why you want to have a grand jury manual at all is to make sure that those that come into the grand jury are well informed as to what their powers are, what they can do, what they can look into, and how to go about doing all of that, which again will be available in my grand jury manual uh, after I get another editor and we uh, we flesh out some more of the, the final chapters about power and put in templates as far as subpoenas and case law like Hale versus Hinkle and USA versus Williams and the like. So to continue, the grand jury is perfectly free to follow its own inclinations. That is the point. Follow its own inclinations, right? You can, there's no rules here because <laughs> you're above government. Technically, that's what the grand jury is. It's considered the fourth branch of government and it is above it. Always has been, always will be. In investigating local government affa governmental affairs, this material is presented for the sole purpose of assisting the jury. Prior consultation with the city attorney, mayor, chief administrative officer, members of the board of supervisors, and other city and county officers may enable the jury to discharge its duties effectively without blunting the sharpness of its observations and recommendations. This is true. Because like I said, you don't have to go through uh, detailed rigmarole to get the information that you want. It should be available to you. Each member of the grand jury will learn a great deal about city and county government and its relationship to its citizens. Well, citizens instead of people. Past grand juries have found such knowledge to be of personal satisfaction and public value. Sure. Grand jurors enjoy a uniquely sensitive position that enables them to gain considerable knowledge of governmental functions and to propose improvements in their effectiveness. That is also true. Because every single municipality, every single corporate governance, whether it be the state government or whether it be aspects of various entire countries are run by corporate governments. Just like Canada. Canada is a corporation that has to register with the American FCC every year because it was established and set up as a corporation, and it still is. Its first prime minister was Mackenzie King. And Mackenzie King, in case anybody doesn't know, was Rockefeller's attorney. So, you get the point. So to continue here, the duties of the grand jury can generally be set forth as follows. To inquire into the conditions and management of public prisons within the county. That's extremely important. Now, this, of course, disregard the penal code because that's irrelevant. The fact that you can, you can look into any jail in the county, whether it be state or federal. Now, if you wanted to look into the operations of a federal prison, then you should form a federal grand jury because that's the difference of the two, juris two jurisdictions, whether it be state or federal, as to what you're dealing with. So if you want to go and deal with something on the federal side, which is sitting on federal land, then form a federal grand jury. Do not form a state grand jury and then try to look into the operations of a federal prison, right? Form a federal grand jury and do that. Uh, secondly here, to inquire into the willful or corrupt misconduct in office of public officers of every description within the county. Exactly. But again, negate and do not worry about the, the penal code. Uh, third, to inquire into sales, transfers, and ownership of lands, which might or should a sheet to the state. Now that is a very telling sentence. Let me go through this so that everybody understands this. Okay. To inquire into sales, transfers and ownership of lands. That doesn't say property, it says lands. 
there's a huge difference between land and property. Most people misconstrue those two things. Property is what sits on top of the land. Land is the land itself, meaning when you hold a lodial title to land, you hold it from the center of the earth out into the universe into infinity, which means you own the airspace above it as well, technically. And that's important to understand here. Okay, now I'm going to continue with this sentence. Which might or should a sheet to the state. The term a sheet means, this isn't going to be a completely technical definition, but you guys can go look it up and Look it up in Bouvier's Law Dictionary in the Vocational Science of Freedom Free Law Library. Look it up in Bouvier's, what the word a sheet means. For something to a sheet basically means that someone did not have a will to properly transfer it to an heir or whoever else they wanted to transfer it to. It doesn't have to be the heir, but the point is, is that the aspect of something to a sheet is that they do not have a will. Now, this is the main problem with this entire corporate governance is that they have stolen your will because you have not laid down your will properly by either doing the vocational science of freedom status docs or that to claim your estate or that your parents and your parents' parents, and sometimes now we're getting into fourth and fifth generations, that Americans' estates were abandoned. Well, not just abandoned, but they were also taken by this aspect in the understanding of this word to a sheet okay when someone gets registered like the, the aspect of a human being being registered and having a birth certificate when they register that property someone later on in time is supposed to come forward and make a proper claim to it and that would be what in english jurisprudence back in the days of the court of wards and liveries would be called suing out your estate that would mean that when someone had come a full age they would go to the court of wards and liveries and they would sue their guardian for their estate. Okay, what is someone's estate? An estate is everything that a man owns in law, common law, okay? And that includes your lands. So in looking at this sentence and thinking about it, to inquire into sales, transfers, and ownership of lands which might or should a sheet to the state. Okay, what's the opposite of that? To inquire into sales, transfers, and ownership of lands, which should not a sheet to the state, based upon the fact that someone has come a full age and they've claimed their estate. So it works both ways. So understand that. Understand the importance of that. They're telling you right there in that one sentence that you can use a grand jury, a, a proper 25-member grand jury, to enforce the vocational science of freedom status doc set because that's what that would be yeah it's e sheet it's e s c h e a t a sheet and like i said go look it up in bouvier's law dictionary on uh, the vocational science of freedom free law library and so to understand this it, if and if you look here's the thing there's there's a certain number of states and Michigan being one of them and there's a few others but uh, I got a I have this whole side project to to get into this understanding of what they've done is that as far as the sheet part is concerned under the original Michigan constitution it established what was called a state board of sheets okay now what is that it's a board that would look into the aspect of anybody that died without a will and so that their estate, uh, and this, you know, land and their estate, all of it, everything, would a sheet to the state. And then what they do is they basically have to put it up for auction to who? We the people. Because we the people are the government. So if someone dies and a man or a woman's stuff is just sitting there, there was no heir to be found and there was no will to be laid down, well then... It is sheets to the state. Now, lo notice that it's lowercase s state, not uppercase s state. It, it is sheets to us. Lowercase s state means we the people. That's us. So we have to determine then what to do with it. Now, again, negate the penal code. Don't worry about that. Because when you do this as a 20, proper 25-member grand jury, you can inquire into any of this anytime you want to, which I think should be one of the first things that we make sure that we do 
in using a 25-member grand jury of the peerage to overcome everything that they've done from 1933 on, which is basically grab everything and say, well, no one's come forward to claim it. And it's all being held in trust under the corporate state or under trust companies like the DTCC at 55 Water Street, New York, New York. So, very important thing to understand, and we should flesh this out over time as to exactly how to do this from using a grand jury to enforce the Vocational Science of Freedom Status Doc Set and to finally, once and for all, make sure that all of us in America hold a lodial title. No more of this idiocy of color of title or tax deeds, meaning property tax deeds, that are all color of title. I have a lot of case law regarding the fact that tax deeds are color of title. Color of title is not a lodial title. And the point is, is that we need to acknowledge the land patents and we need to claim our title properly, which we have a process for. It's called the Declaration of Lodial Lands, which drove the governor of Wisconsin crazy about 10 years ago. But that's a story for another day. So to continue, to investigate and report on the operations, accounts, and records of the officers, departments, or functions of the county, including those operations, accounts, and records of any special legislative district or other district in the county created pursuant to state law for which the officers of the county are serving in their ex officio capacity as officers of the districts. Such investigations may be conducted on or, yeah, conducted on selective basis each year. So, what does that say? You can look into anything that they're doing. Any officer. And it says, and I think it's interesting that they say ex officio capacity. That's basically a, a sneaky way of saying de facto. <laughs> and by the way, the term de facto means illegitimate but in effect. So kind of like the mob comes around to you every month to come and collect their protection money so that nothing happens to your business when you're basically paying them off to not destroy your business. Corporate government works exactly the same way. That's what they are. There's just a mob of attorneys who steal everything from you. And until we wake up to this and fully understand what they're doing through reading things like this and also going through and reading the treatise on de facto government, which I've also put up in the VSOF Law Library, we're never going to fully wrap our minds around what in the hell is actually going on. Okay? So... To continue, the performance of this duty may require the auditing of books, which should be accomplished as economically as possible. Previous audits and recommendations of auditors are available to you. In addition, the Internal Audits Division of the Controller's Office conducts a number of audits each year, the results of which are available to the civil grand jury. And, of course, they're available to the common law grand jury as well. So, all right, so to continue here, um, you should study the work and possible expense involved before in employing an auditor. The contract with the auditor must be approved by the court. Now, that's an aspect of auditing various different offices or whatnot. And a 25-member grand jury doesn't have to worry about that, per se. And also, again, what it said previously is that a lot of the information that you can gather from various different governmental offices is already available to the grand jury to begin with. So you don't have to go through some sort of elaborate process to get the information. The grand jury shall not duplicate any examination of financial statements which have been performed by or for the Board of Supervisors. Now that's, again, that's an aspect of... And you see here how the difference between Roman civil law and them having a Board of Supervisors is a way of them kind of controlling their own corporate ongoings without allowing this de facto civil grand jury to get in there and start looking into things or to possibly investigating as to what truly is going on. So the grand jury may enter into a joint contract with the Board of Supervisors to employ 
the services of an expert. Again, this is just California stuff you don't have to worry about. The grand jury is urged to study the report of the last grand jury and review the recommendations of recent grand juries for improvements in county government. Now, that's true. You should, uh, like, because like I said before, the records of the grand jury are a perpetual record from one grand jury to the next. So after the examination of a city and count, county accounts and records, you may order the city attorney in his or her capacity as county counsel to institute suit to recover any monies that, in your judgment, may be due the county. So the civil grand juries are, in a way, kind of being debt collectors. I mean, that's basically what that paragraph was talking about. Not only must the grand jury inquire into the county records, but it may examine the books and records of any special purpose, assessing, taxing district, or, quote, joint powers agency, located wholly or in part in the county. So, taxing district. Hmm. Right. Like, property tax? Let's once and for all, to end all of this, get to the bottom of exactly why they think they can tax a load of land. I think that would be a great thing to do in every single state. Start there. Because as many wise men have said over the years, if you don't own your land, you are, by definition, a slave. You have a landlord. You own nothing. And the basis of American society in saying, no, we're not going to deal with this anymore, meaning deal with anything above us aside from our own self-governance is one of the critical aspects of understanding the difference between American jurisprudence and everything that came beforehand because we are self-governing if we do so through a grand jury. So to continue, to investigate and report upon the needs of all county offices or sorry, officers, in the county, including the abolition or creation of offices and the equipment for, or the method or system of performing the duties of the several offices. Such investigation and report shall be conducted selectively each year. So, what does that mean? It means you can look into, what again, whatever the hell it is you want to. To continue, to submit a little later than the end of each fiscal year, or sorry, each fiscal or calendar year of a county, to the presiding judge of the Superior Court, a final report of its findings and recommendations that pertain to county government matters other than fiscal matters during that year, to submit no later than the end of each fiscal or calendar year to the presiding judge of the Superior Court, a final report of its findings and recommendations that pertain to fiscal matters of county government during that year. Again, negate the penal code if you're running this as an actual 25-member grand jury of the peerage. But again, what does that mean? It means you can look into whatever you want to. Copies are to be transferred to each member of the Board of Supervisors of the county. See, that's where they have, in, at least in California here, that's where they're taking that control. They're telling you right here in that single sentence, copies are to be transmitted to each member of the Board of Supervisors of the county. They're telling you right there that you're an infant. That's what that means, I mean, in a nutshell. They're saying you don't have the right to run everything. You have to take it to them. They're the ones that actually run everything, right, through their corporation. Anyway, no later than 90 days after the grand jury submits final report on the operations of any public agency subject to its reviewing authority, which is unlimited if you're doing a common law grand jury. Again, the governing body of the public agency so comment to the presiding judge on the findings and recommendations pertaining to matters under the control of the governing body and every elective county officer or agency head for which the grand jury has responsibility pursuant to penal code blah, blah, blah shall comment within 60 days to the presiding judge with an information copy sent to the Board of Supervisors. Again, that aspect of you're just a bunch of infants and you have to give it to the masters. On the findings and recommendations pertaining to matters under the control of the county officer or agency head of head and agency or agencies which that officer or agency head supervises or controls. In the city and county of San Francisco, the mayor is also required to comment on the findings and recommendations of the grand jury. Again, penal code. You can skip that. Don't worry about it. Limitations on investigatory power. 
While the grand jury is author and again, this is an aspect of a civil grand jury of a bunch of infants. While the grand jury is authorized by statute to employ experts, auditors, or appraisers to aid in its examination of county financial records and the needs of county officers, it is not authorized to employ investigations or experts for other purposes. Well, again, depends what you decided to form the grand jury for, right? And the very beginning of that sentence, while the grand jury is authorized by statute to employ experts, no. The grand jury, when it's properly formed, can do whatever it wants to. It can hire investigators, it can, it can hire experts, it can use the county funds to do so, it can audit whatever it wants to, it can appraise whatever it wants to, to examine into anything in the county including but not limited to the needs of county offices, right? And the idea that it's not authorized to employ investigators or experts for other purposes is ludicrous. There is nothing higher than a 25-member grand jury of the peerage. But, again, this is the reason why we're going over this particular civil grand jury manual, is to show where their control over the infants lies. So, to continue, for example, the California Supreme Court has held that the jury does not have inherent power to establish its own investigatory apparatus for the detection of crime. Well, because in California, they have two separate grand juries. They have a civil grand jury, and then they have an indictment grand jury. So, if that was set up by, and I'm not sure of this, but if it was set up by California Constitution, then no, the quote-unquote civil grand jury would not have that. However, I'm quite certain that in every single state constitution, it simply, it, when it talks about the grand jury, it doesn't differentiate between two separate different kinds of grand jury. So, both practice and statute have left this function to law enforcement officials. Well, again, the grand jury is the law enforcement official if indeed they wish to be so because they can investigate whatever they want to about anything in the county. As again, I said, if it's an aspect of a county grand jury. If you're forming a federal grand jury, then you're dealing with federal things. A grand jury may not, under our laws, use either private or public funds to employ special counsel or special investigators. Well, again, that's an aspect of California. And again, that would, determine, that would be determined upon what the Constitution said. I know for a fact that in, I think it was Missouri? Or it might have been might have been Minnesota, where there was a a grand jury that formed, and it decided on its own volition to hire its own investigators because who they were investigating were the quote unquote law enforcement people, meaning the and I believe this was yeah it was for Minneapolis St Paul, and they were investigating the mayor and they were investigating the police chief. I said, we don't care we'll hire our own investigators. And they did. And then they ended up bringing indictment against both of them, and both of them were ousted from their public offices. So, can are you restricted? Again, no. But, so, this, pay no attention to this from a standpoint that it's a civil grand jury manual for infants. <laughs> In the event that the employment of special counsel or special investigators appears necessary... A request, therefore, should be made to the Attorney General of the State of California. Now, you can you can give notice to the State's Attorney General if you want to, but you certainly don't have to. You can also give notice to the presiding judge of the county, again, but you don't have to. When you're a 25-member grand jury of the peerage, that's the difference. Okay, to continue. Moreover, a grand jury should not engage in fishing expeditions. Okay, that's... These guys basically saying, don't go and be a runaway grand jury. You know, don't go have your own ideas about things. Or do what you feel is necessary to get rid of corruption in your county. That's basically what that means. Or, and I like how they, the attorney finishes this, or indiscriminate meddling. Meddling? Meddling. No. You're a corporation. You exist because we allow you to exist. Full stop. 
I will look into whatever I feel like looking into, period. Because you're de facto government. Anyway, to continue. The scope of inquiry is limited to those subjects that are founded upon knowledge, which comes to the jury not by rumors and reports, but by knowledge acquired from the evidence before them or from their own observations. That should also, that basically should say, are from their own inquiry, meaning investigatory inquiry. A grand jury shall not make a report, declaration, or recommendation on any matter except on the basis of its own investigation. Well, there, see how they're being contradictory as to the previous paragraph, or second previous paragraph? A grand jury shall not make a report, declaration, or recommendation on any matter except on the basis of its own investigation. So what are they saying? They're saying you can investigate. See, the contradiction of how attorneys write these things is unbelievable. Anyway, also a grand jury shall not adopt as its own the recommendations of another grand jury unless it does so after its own investigation of the matter. Again, you can investigate whatever you want to. Okay, quorum. A quorum for a meeting or the transition of business consists of 12 jurors. Well, in a common law grand jury, it would have to consist of, guess what? 13 jurors, because 13 is more than 51% of 25. The grand jury may act only as a body. An individual grand jury has no more authority than any private citizen does. Wrong. That's pretty telling, as far as what they're telling you, as far as infants are concerned. The hell it doesn't. And Hale versus Hinkle specifically says that it does. And so does USA versus Williams. Okay, the grand jury may act only as a body. That part of it is correct, and it's when it brings an indictment. An individual grand juror has no more authority than a private citizen does. That's untrue. Because if four of you, four members of the grand jury, so I guess, well, actually in a weird way, that is kind of slightly correct. But the point is that if, you, if four of you go out and say, we are the investigators of the grand jury, as four of you, as per the Magna Carta, then you do. So in a weird way, this is kind of sort of correct. But remove the word, you know, private citizen. It, if you're one of the people, that's different. Because you could, or the grand jury could, um, create grand jury investigator status and send one of the grand jurors out to go do something. And even though I would technically send four just to make it correct to the common law and the Magna Carta. But the point is, is that you guys can do whatever you want to do. Okay. The importance of your work requires that each of you be present at all sessions, except for the most pressing reasons. Okay. I'd agree with that. Secret sessions. A grand jury is a secret as well as a legal tribunal. Right. You can do everything you want to in secret. You don't, have, you don't have to tell anybody what you're doing. And, as well as a legal tribunal. So, the law requires the grand jury to take an oath of secrecy. Yes, it does. In meetings of the civil grand jury, no person is permitted to be present other than those persons invited or requested to attend. An interpreter, if appropriate. A stenographic reporter. And nowadays we can just record everything by computer, so we don't have to worry about that. If necessary. So what's that saying? That's saying if the district attorney shows up and starts making problems, kick him out of the room. The judge of the Superior Court may be present when his advice is requested. True, that's fine, but that's up to the grand jury. The proceedings of the grand jury must be conducted in the utmost secrecy. Agreed. The rule is of extreme importance. Also agreed. But pay no attention to the rule. It's simply an aspect of the Magna Carta. Okay. But we can read this to see how they, the attorney put it up here. Every grand juror who, except when required by a court, willfully discloses any evidence adducted before the grand jury or anything which he himself or any other member of the grand jury has said, or in what manner he or she or any other grand juror has voted on a matter before them, is guilty of a misdemeanor. Well, you can't charge a common law grand jury with anything when they're doing what they're doing. And clearly, because everything's supposed to be secret, how are they supposed to know anyway? So, the statute itself is, is ludicrous, and even how it's written. So, to continue, in following this rule, you can use no halfway measures, half statements, or 
innuendos by a grand juror lead to speculation, rumor, and violation of the law. Well, it just leads to a violation of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So what you're doing is you always want to use grammar, logic, and rhetoric to come to your conclusion, whatever that may be, in your grand juries. And so grammar is the who, what, when, where of a situation, and logic is the why, and then your rhetoric is explaining the five W's plus how. How did this come about? And in your rhetoric or in your writings, that's where you encompass all three, and that's known as the trivium, which there's a whole class on in the Vocational Science Freedom YouTube page where you guys can read and understand about the trivium. A juror must not confide any information concerning the proceedings even to a husband, wife, or a close friend. That's a good rule. There are, however, two situations when a grand juror may be compelled to disclose the proceedings in the grand jury room. The first exception permits any court to require a grand juror to disclose the testimony of a witness examined before the grand jury for the purpose of ascertaining whether that testimony is consistent with that witness's testimony before the court. Right, that'd be an aspect of perjury, so that would be correct. And again, pay no attention to the code. The second exception allows a grand juror to be questioned on charges of perjury. Again, see, I said it before they said it. Of which that grand juror may have been guilty in making accusations or giving testimony to his fellow jurors. Yeah, so it's, it's about a perjury thing. So I would, yeah, I would agree with that. To summarize, the rule of secrecy requires that witnesses shall remain before the grand jury only while testifying. The judge of the Superior Court and the city attorney are entitled, well, no. In a civil grand jury, they're entitled, but not in a common law grand jury. To be present upon, oh, upon request. Okay, fine. To give advice to the civil grand jury. The sternograph reporter and interpreter may be present when necessary. That's fine. All of these individuals must retire when the jury deliberates and discusses the matter and votes upon the question before it. Right. So kick them all out before you vote. So, again, this is code, but it says, Every person who, by any means whatsoever, willfully and knowingly and without knowledge and consent of the grand jury, records or attempts to record all or part of the proceedings of any grand jury while it is deliberating or voting, or listens to or observes or attempts to listen to or observe the proceedings of any grand jury of which he is not a member while such jury is deliberating or voting is guilty of a misdemeanor. Again, just keep your secrecy and that's not going to come up anyway. Because of the necessity and requirement for secrecy of your proceedings, it is suggested that, as a matter of policy, policy, not public law, all publicity emanate from one source only. And we talked about that before, about having a officer, which is a liaison, or basically your press agent for the grand jury. And that can be the foreman, or it can be anybody that you so choose to be. So, number three, public sessions. The court may order that certain investigations be conducted in public. That's fine. Or you can determine that certain investigations should be conducted in public. The grand jury can do that. Matters involving misconduct of public officers, which are found to affect the general welfare. Right. Now, I think they specifically state that in here because they want to know what you're going to try to end up doing so they can get ahead of it and try to figure out ways to weasel out of it. So, in that particular situation, I would say, forget about it. Keep it secret anyway. Such order of the court may be obtained upon the field written joint request of the district attorney, again, whatever, or district, or attorney general, and the grand jury acting through, again, through its foreperson. Yeah, that's the point. Foreperson says, you know, forget it, then it's, that's the end of the story. All right, the grand jury and the city attorney. The city attorney is the civil legal advisor to the city and county. Hmm. Right. And all of its departments, officers, and commissions. In San Francisco, the city attorney acts as county counsel. The penal code authorizes the grand jury to request advice of the county counsel. It also allows the county counsel to be present during sessions of the grand jury pertaining to civil matters if the jury desires his advice. So again, you got somebody in there who's barging in or doing something, tell them to get out. And guess what? If they, don't get, if they won't get out, call the sheriff. If at any time the grand jury concludes that money is due and owing to the city and county and not collected, it may order the city attorney, as county counsel, to institute legal actions for its collection. 
Notice how <laughs> notice how that all they're caring about in this grand jury manual. I mean, this is like the third time they've mentioned collections or money owed to the county, right? Notice how they're using the grand jury as basically debt collectors. Well, again, it's a de facto grand jury, so are they really able to collect a debt? Well, yes and no. Only from citizens of the United States, but not from people. So, just remember that. Inasmuch as the city attorney acts as legal advisor to the grand jury, he or she is bound by oath, the secrecy restrictions on grand jury matters, and the confidentiality of the attorney client relationship. The grand jury and elected authors. I think we'll go through this section and probably quit for the night. Now we can have Q&A. Elected and appointed officers will necessarily come under the scrutiny of the civil grand jury during its investigation of the various civil and county departments. While in most counties the grand jury is empowered to vote an accusation against an elected or appointed officer for willful or corrupt misconduct in office, and thereby direct a jury trial solely to the issue of his or her right to remain in office is not the case in San Francisco. Well, too bad. It's the case everywhere. Any time that any grand jury wants to try the title to an office, they can do so. Period. That's the really interesting thing that I learned in going through and beginning to get deep into the the treatise on de facto government, which again is in the VSOF online law library. And I'll, I'll post a link after class because I don't want to go digging for it right now, but I know it's in there. And the hubris of these attorneys when talking about the validity of de facto government and blah, blah, blah. And we can't, you can't try the title of someone this way or that way or this way or that way. And then they finally give it up that, like, yes, you can try it under uh, Cole Warranto. But the point is, is the grand jury can try it whenever the hell they damn well want to. Say a judge doesn't have a bond. Say he's never filed his oath. A grand jury can totally investigate into that and then bring an indictment for anything from impersonating a public officer to treason. So do not pay any attention to what you can or can't do as far as it, and the other thing about this sentence, and I know it's kind of lengthy, but to go through it, all right, yes, they'll come under the scrutiny during the investigation. Now, again, while most counties, the grand jury is empowered to vote an accusation, okay, an accusation is, is not a charge. It's different, or it's not an indictment. An accusation is something that's like, oh, I accuse you, of, it's weak, it's... It, not even the proper term, which is, of course, probably why it's in quote. Okay. If grand jury wants to t try a title of an officer, then they should do so by somebody coming upon their own writ of quo warranto and then bringing it to the grand jury and say, yes, we should, we should indict on a, on a original common law writ of quo warranto and say, get out of here. You don't have your oath, you don't have your bond, or whatever else they might be, you know, a situation of, say, they're say they're a foreigner or something, or they have some inability to hold office because of uh, where, you know, their citizenship, like Obama. Um, you can do that. There's there's no restriction there. Because you, as the grand jury, are the final say as to what is and what is not lawful in that county. Period. There's nothing higher than the grand jury. So, to continue. Again, don't worry about the code. So section, whatever, of the charter of the city and county of San Francisco. Well, of the charter. Now, that's interesting. What's a charter? Charterability? The first time charters came out, you got to remember this, is that when you go back into antiquity of the history of law, kings and queens would create charters for, and a lot of times it'd be for, people to go out in ships and to go find things and to claim those things in the name of the king or the queen. That was their charter. Why? Because they were charting a course. Well, what is a charter of a corporation? Same damn thing. A charter of a corporation charts the course or the ability of that corporation to exist. And if you look at these municipal charters, you'll find that they're doing all kinds of things that they were never chartered to do. Well, what does that mean? If a corporation exceeds its charter... You can pull its charter 
meaning you don't exist anymore, which, by the way, has happened plenty of times in America. In fact, I recall there was a, a news article that I read not all that long ago. It was probably three or four months ago, something like that. And this city, this chartered city, this chartered corporation, decided to levy some sort of tax or something against the, the people in the city. And the city, being outside of its charter, the people said, well, then we're going to pull your charter. You're not going to be a city anymore. We're just going to get rid of you. And they did. Now, I don't care what size the city it is. I don't give a damn if it's San Francisco or New York. It, it's irrelevant. Or if it's, you know, you know, some backwoods, tiny little, itty-bitty little incorporated thing. It doesn't matter. The process is exactly the same. It's this idea that this too-big-to-fail idea has to be removed from everyone's minds. If the charter of a city is not being abided by, then pull it. And I, again, I don't give a damn if it's San Francisco or L.A. or New York. It's gone. You can, call, you can come up with another charter and call the city something else tomorrow. But this charter is over. And then I suppose you could break it into a thousand little cities if you wanted to. Whatever. Would that cause chaos? Mm, depending. Probably to the oligarchs it would. It wouldn't to us. Because we have to pull every single charter of every single corporation that is causing harm. Now, not to digress here, but the point is, is that there are uncountable amounts of corporations right now that are basically doing nothing but harm. So that should be something that the grand jury should pay attention to. And we should come up with a totality of a system, meaning a process, of which to, yeah, of which to pull a charter of a corporation and dissolve it. And basically what that comes down to is harm. You see, corporations... And there's a, there's a great documentary called The Corporation, which I think you can still find on YouTube. It was done by a, a Canadian uh, investigative journalist, I think. And he goes through everything of what a corporation is and how it gets created. And again, this comes directly from this understanding in the history of law of what charterability is. The capacity to charter a course under what? Under law. Well, back then, what was the law? The decree of a sovereign. Well, what's the law in America? Again, the decree of our sovereign, of us, whether it be in our own individual courts of record, where we decree the law of the case, or whether it be in the form of a grand jury, where we're saying, this is the law. You've caused harm. This is common law. You're gone. Full stop. Like I said, it's not rocket science to figure out how we should do this precisely. It's been done in the past, like I said. And so we take big, small examples, we put them together, and we form a committee of the VSOF to investigate into how we can do this. And anybody that wants to be part of it can join. I'm going to start organizing more committees to specific subjects of research. Poseidon and I have been working on the history of what happened in 1933, like everything that happened in 1933 when they stole everything. So that's something that we're working on. I think this is another good thing that can be focused on and said, yeah, let's look at this. Let's look how to pull a charter. How do you, how do you end a corporation? Because that corporation is causing damage, harm, loss, or injury, right? I think this is another great research thing that we can get into. But, okay, so like I said, not to digress, okay, to get back here. So, the charter of the city of uh, city and county of San Francisco provides that a mayor may suspend any elected officer and certain other officials for official misconduct. Well, that's all fine and dandy if he were to do so. Thereafter, written charges are filed with the Board of Supervisors. Again, this creature that they have in here that's saying, well, you have to do it with us, you bunch of infants. Anyway, and the accused official is entitled to a hearing before the board. Right, so what they're saying is that, well, you can go before the board and speak your case because you're one of us you know you can give us masonic symbols and 
and do your little dance and stuff and say, oh, no, I'm one of you guys. Don't take me out. And then they'll say, oh, no, you can stay there. You're one of us. Right? Well, when a 25-member grand jury does it, eh, that's not going to happen. So, anyway. If the Board of Supervisors, by three-fourths vote of all members of the board, notice it's not unanimous, sustain the charges, the elected official is then removed from office, which I can almost guarantee if you go through history and look this up, even in San Francisco, yeah, it's probably a handful of times when it's happened throughout the entire charter of San Francisco. I can almost guarantee that. Without even having to look at it, I can tell you that. The mayor has the power to suspend such officer when the hearing is pending, meaning he can just chuck them before the Board of Supervisors says anything, and to appoint a qualified person to discharge the duties of the office during the suspension, basically a whatever officer pro tem. Any person, including elected officials, can be indicted by the indictment grand jury. Okay, now that's the point, because like I said, the aspect that California is running two separate grand juries, they're running this, uh, they're running an indictment grand jury, and then they're running what we're looking at, this, this civil grand jury, right? So, but a 25-member grand jury can do both. So, if he or she has violated any criminal statute of the state and the crime is a felony. Well, any criminal statute of the state, what about just violating the common law? They did harm. Done deal. That's all the de jure grand jury needs, right? And the crime is a felony. Well, Maybe it's not a felony. Maybe he did 552 misdemeanors under your statutes. I don't give a damn what it is. It's the second that he causes harm, he's gone. Or she is gone. That's it. So, regardless of any action taken under section whatever of the charter. So, Okay, we'll finish this up and then we'll finish for the night. The grand jury and city and county officers. Each city and county officer is qualified and willing to answer any questions pertaining to the specific functions discharged by his or her department and to assist the civil grand jury in procuring information within his or her knowledge of a special province. Well, that makes sense. It is not an unusual occurrence for, the, for a grand jury to expend a substantial period of time investigating a complaint or question raised by a member of the jury. Now get that. To expend a substantial period of time investigating a complaint or question raised by a member of the jury. Okay. Right. So when all of you are together, if any one of you wants to raise something, be like, yeah, we should look into that. Yeah, we should pull that guy's financial records. Or we should pull a judge's 501c3 slush fund, his little private religious, quote-unquote, non-for-profit retirement fund. Right? Or pull the Kaffirs of the entire county. That's the point. Raised by a member of the jury. So you can do whatever you want to. Right? Get the point. Or a member of the public. Again, get that point. If anybody comes walking in and, start, and knocks on the door and says, hey, um, I got something you guys need to look into. Okay? Come before us. What's your proof? What's your evidence? Give us your grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Yeah? Okay. Sounds interesting. You got any corroborating witnesses? Yeah, I got so-and-so and so-and-so. And so and so. Great, bring them in. Okay, great, we'll be here tomorrow. Okay, wonderful. Dig into it. Find out. And then, make sure that it's valid. Right? Just do not take somebody's word on something. Like, because you'll probably end up... When we start doing this in a way where everybody's well aware of the fact that we've taken back over our government, you are going to have an untold amount of filthy Luciferian scumbags coming in and saying, now this guy did this and this guy did that and that guy did... Well, why? And what's your relation to him? And are you just wasting the grand jury's time? Because if you are, we'll hold you in contempt of the grand jury for wasting our time, you little scumbag. Because you're going to get a lot of that. When we fully turn over our American Republic back to being in our absolute control, you will you will run into this. It will show up. People will come up with all kinds of various different things and lies and whatever, so forth and so forth. False accusations, uh, of which most of the time will be unsubstantiated. So be careful of the member of the public part, because 
they can lead you astray and down rabbit holes that'll waste all kinds of your time. I mean, I've had to deal with this recently about false accusations and people lying about me in one way, shape, or form that I've had to deal with. And some people who are wiser than I am have said, well, don't even worry about it. Forget about it. It's, it's not true. And second, why are you wasting your time going down to someone else's lower vibrational frequency to have to deal with their insanity? And I thought to myself, well, yeah, that's a good point. You know, so be aware of it because it will happen. Because like I said, it just happened to me this week. But anyway, to continue, consequently, it is good practice and basically fair to ensure that city and county officers are given ample opportunity to answer any questions or explain any complaints which are being considered by the grand jury or its committees. That I absolutely agree with. Get the guy in there. Ask him what's going on. Hey, we heard this. Hey, we heard that. Is there any, you know, and look at him, watch him, record him, video record him. Look for clues. There are at least 25 different ways to show or prove that someone's lying, meaning hints. There's eye movement. There's body language. There's tone of voice. There's cadence. There's rhythm. There's all kinds of things that will not be a 100% factor as to know that he's lying, but you'll get an idea. So you'll know which way to which way the wind's blowing, basically. So yeah, get them down there. Tell them to explain themselves. And they don't even have to be subpoenaed in front of the full grand jury. You can tell them to, you know, write a brief on it or whatever. Say here, write say, hey, write an affidavit regarding this. We heard this information. You know, what say you? Right? You take care of it like that. That way, you don't have to waste a bunch of time, a bunch of the grand jury's time, um, waiting around for somebody that's late or somebody that sits there when you get when you actually get them in front of the grand jury and babbles for half an hour, right, about how unfair everything is, but as is not answering the questions, right? So anyway, you can do this. You can investigate. You can bring people before you. They have to answer you. And again, if you want to look into the fact of that as far as having to answer you or having to produce the documents, just look into Hale versus Hinkle, which is in... The whole entire case is in the folder for the class six docs and links for grand jury. They have to answer. And if they do not produce the documents, you can hold them in contempt of the grand jury for failure to produce the documents. And not even a habeas corpus will get them out, which is extremely important to remember, which is exactly what happened in Hale versus Hinkle. The grand jury subpoenaed documents from a corporation. The guy who was in charge of holding the documents said, I'm not giving them to you because you're not coming up with a good enough reason for me to do so. The grand jury said, okay, fuck you. Go sit in jail for a while. And then he, you know, screamed to high hell and said, I'm going to file a habeas corpus. And the judge said, uh, you're being held in contempt of the grand jury. I can't, under any circumstances, by law, sign off on a habeas corpus to get you out because the grand jury is above me and you particularly as a corporation and as an officer of that corporation there's you, you can't get out until you comply with what they want so understand that understand that in Hale versus Hinkle tells you all of the true power of a grand jury so with that um, let me read what Dig wrote here okay a city charter or town Charter generally, municipal charter is a legal document charter establishing a municipality, such as a city or town. The concept developed in Europe during the Middle Ages. Yes, it did. Which is, like I said, charterability when it came to the kings and the queens, creating these corporations for what? Their own profit. But that gets into, well, anyway, I'm not going to rehash the timeline, Doc. Traditionally, the granting of a charter gave a settlement in its evidence the right to town privileges under the feudal system. Right, under the feudal system. Right, so under f under fee, fee oath, fidelity, which is why you have a fidelity bond connected to your birth certificate. Because you're chattel. Anyway, townspeople who lived in the charter incorporated in the simple service. Okay, towns were often free in the sense that they were directly protected by the king or emperor, exactly, and were not part of a feudal fief. Right, see, see, see that right there? Understand that during the feudal system, the kings and the queens, the ones that were specifically the serpent seed line scumbags and left over from the cult of Rome, what they did was 
they made sure that they created corporations that would then govern people. Okay? That's not hard to see here. In fact, this is right out of Wiki. Not that Wiki's any tremendous aspect or, or place to get information, but even they have this right. So the process for granting is determined by a type of government or a state in question. In monarchies, charters are still often a royal charter. Right, royal charter given by the crown. Right, the crown is another corporation. That's why it's got a capital C. The crown corporation is a corporation which runs all of the what used to be all of the commonwealths of the English Empire. And who runs the English Empire? The filthy, hook-nosed Rothschilds. Period. Full stop. They even boasted about it after they set up their Bank of England. Or the authorities acting behalf of the Crown in federations and granting charters made within the jurisdiction of the lower level of government, such as Providence. Okay, yeah, right, yeah. So, anyway. So, yeah. So that gives you an insight into what you have as de facto corporate governance. But instead, what they wanted to do after the Civil War is they wanted to create a civil government, set it into Washington, D.C., and confuse everybody, and then have everybody turn around and pledge allegiance to a filthy corporation. Time to wake up, people, and understand what we're dealing with here. And the fact that they have no jurisdiction over we the people at all. But, again, you have to establish the fact that you are one of the people through the Vocational Science of Freedom Status Doc set and lay it out on the public record so that you have a will, right? So that you're not subject to all of your estate being sheeted to the corporate state, which is exactly what's going on ever since 1933 and in other places and, dare I say, countries. Are, is the exact same thing going on. Canada's the same, New Zealand's the same, Australia's the same, England's the same. Uh, South Africa is kind of still the same, even though they went kind of sideways. But, so anyway. Okay, Chief, so if the board of directors of the corporation violate their own charter and the corporation is subject to dissolution, how does the grand jury, anyone, pull the charter? Right, that's what we need to get into. But I know it's been done before. In fact, like I said, the towns, the bunch of people in the town simply pulled the charter from, yeah, charter equals contract, and and pulled the charter of the of the city and said, you're not going to be a city anymore. We dissolve you. Okay. So that process is out there. So it'd be the same damn process. Like I said, I don't care how big the city is. I don't care if it's, uh, you know, L.A. or New York. doesn't matter. No, the way no knees. The way they did it was I don't believe they did it by grand jury. They had some other way of doing it, but I know it. I know that they did it. So, first step would be looking into information regarding. Um, well, no, what you're talking about, chief. What we're all talking about here is that, no, you didn't jump the gun. What we're all talking about here is how do we go about systematically finding the information and doing research on the topic which is what we're all here to, to do. I mean, the vocational science of freedom is about self-governance, self-awareness, self-defense, and self-reliance, with the core understanding being that you are a free, sovereign people. So how do we do this, right? So we start by looking into that, start by looking into, and again, understanding the background of what charters are, and thanks, Dig, for the, you know, for the aspect of what is said, what you dropped here for Wiki, and... And yeah, and to understand what a charter is, what charterability is, like I said before. And know that it is not something that's absolute. No way is it absolute. Again, we get into this, our current idea of, I should say, zeitgeist and what's going on in the world, of this idea of corporations that are too big to fail. That is absolutely asinine. It is. It always has been. The second that a corporation goes sideways, goes off their charter, they should instantaneously, unequivocally have their charter pulled and have their corporation dissolved. Immediately. Because they caused harm. And not to put too fine a point on it, but I and a group of people proved that the United States Federal Corporation was causing harm back in 2014. And we CC'd a, a lot of people regarding the... The court case, as far as that they basically defaulted on the fact, they never argued it. They never argued that they were causing harm. 
So we defaulted them, and then we informed the IMF, and the IMF pulled their pulled their special drawing rights. I have a screenshot of it. The IMF pulled the special drawing rights from the United States Federal Corporation when we did that. Okay? So don't tell me it can't be done, because basically we did it with the United States Federal Corporation in a weird sideways manner. But the point is, is that you can crush any of them. So with all that fun stuff having been said, we're a little bit past. So I will thank everybody for showing up. And this has been the Vocational Science of Freedom, Civics and Sovereignty class for Saturday. These are free classes that you can join on Saturday by joining the Vocational Science Freedom Guild server. And this has been our discussion of the Civil Grand Jury Manual of the City and County of San Francisco, of which we will continue next Saturday. So I thank everybody for coming, and I'll turn off the recording, and so we can then talk amongst ourselves.